welcome everyone back to our podcast today. I'm so excited. I've never met Sean in person, face to face before this, but I'm excited to be the best way we can, like everybody right now is via Zoom. So, uh, Sean Galloway, everyone, I'm really excited to chat with this gentleman because he is a true safety expert and an expert that goes beyond the compliance, goes beyond regulations, and really focuses and hones in on culture, which is what we're all here to learn about, is how do we take our safety program to the next level? How do we take our business to the next level? And so I'm just so excited to nerd out on safety with you today. And um, I'll probably have to cut myself short because I have a lot of questions for you. But, um, But welcome, Sean. Thank you so much for being here today. Happy to be here, although virtually, but happy to be here. Thank you. Yes. So I just super curious, um, you know, one thing that looking on um, ProAct Safety's website, looking at your business's website, I just really noticed that something really stuck out to me was that your audience or your ideal client already has a safety culture. I noticed on there that it wasn't, you guys were reaching out to people saying, hey, you already have a great safety culture. How do we take it to the next level? So was there something there that you, um, not that you don't work with companies that are complete startups, but who's your ideal customer? Who do you, who do you guys love working with? So we're very fortunate that you know, we were established in 1993 by my business partner, Terry Mathis, and I joined the company in 05, became the president and co-owner in 2008 or 2009. And we're very fortunate that we have such a strong brand visibility that we don't really pursue any clients, which we very fortunate we recognize that, that 95 to 98% of the organizations that reach out do just that. They, they contact us and they've heard of us or they've worked with us in, in previous uh, employment or, or, or companies. But everybody has a safety culture. And, that, and that's one of the things to, to really realize is that we, we first started putting attention on safety culture in 1986 when two major events happened, Challenger and Chernobyl. And at that time, it was the coming together and the realization that what we do from a compliance, from an engineering standpoint, we should always start with. About 10 years prior to that, we really started discovering kind of the behavioral component, but then what those values are, how decisions are made. When those two events happened, we started realizing it's, it's what the priorities are, how, again, decisions are made. What's the storytelling that goes on in the organization? So the companies that tend to engage us already realize that. They realize that I think it was Peter Drucker that said, maybe it was Deming, but your organizational systems are perfectly designed to give you the results you are currently receiving. Oh my God. So everybody has a culture. You have common beliefs, you have common behaviors, common decisions, common experiences and stories that all come together that then norm new people as they join that tribe, they join that crew. So everybody has that. So it's just a matter of how do we get better? So the organizations that tend to contact us are, are looking for how do we do things better? And those are the companies that get it because I still find working across all major industries, yeah. there's still this mentality that more is the answer. And sometimes sometimes we need to stop doing things. If we're doing things you know, culturally that disengage, demotivate, create a sense of vulnerability that we shouldn't have or invulnerability, I'm sorry, then sometimes there's things that we need to stop doing. So it's to me that the typical company that we work with are already doing really, really well. They want to get better. And we're fortunate that we've served as advisors and coaches to most of the best safety performing, you know, in your industry and in all major industries, the, the big players, if you will. So we've seen the journey that they've been on. So a lot of companies try to contact us to try to optimize the things that they're doing, make sure they're going in the right direction. And what they're doing is creating the perception that we're going in the right direction with the workforce that we end up with that culture of want to versus culture of have to. (laughs) Wow. And I like how you mentioned, I mean, you, you work with several industries, you know, just Mm -hmm. work with one type of company. And so what are those, maybe if somebody's listening today and they're looking to take their safety culture to the next level, and let's say that they do have, a, a, a safety culture where leadership is bought in, um, 
but they're just they're, they're just stuck. They're looking, they have a few incidents, maybe one incident, like a few incidents a year. They're looking to take it to the next level. What would be the biggest piece of advice or maybe something that you've seen that's a common thread of doesn't matter the industry when you're taking someone to the next level, what are they missing? So I'll, I'll answer that with two, two pieces of, of thought, if you will. One is that we have to continuously mature our thinking around what is and what isn't excellence and safety. I, you know, you mentioned nerding out over this, you know, I, I kind of have the same perspective in what I focus on. I was very fortunate in 2012, I was the keynote speaker of the first ever conference and safety for the country of Azerbaijan. And it was this, all these people around the world come together, a country that was only really about 20 years or so old after breaking away from Russia. And they're starting to really concentrate on occupational safety. So as I was there, I kind of had my own moment as I'm running on this treadmill, looking out over the Caspian Sea and Baku, that my mission is to continuously challenge the thinking around what is and what isn't excellence and safety. Gosh, so, I love that. Okay. So, so with that, I've always said there's three things you have to have to truly be excellent in safety. This is one way I'm answering and the other is I'm going to answer it more strategically. But one is one aspect of excellence is still going to be our lagging indicators, at least for the next decade or so. There's many pioneering organizations that are starting to not focus as much of that on the scorecard, because as you get closer to zero, it loses its statistical significance anyways. So it doesn't tell you anything when you only have one or two events that are out there. So it's still the lagging. The second piece, I think, of the three are the hardest, and that's knowing precisely what's leading to your results. If you have great performance or you've lost your way one month and you can't point to why, we need to work to manage the luck out of the equation. And then the third yeah. piece is having that mindset of regardless how well we're performing, we can always be better. I don't care the industry. Five years ago, we could have a conversation in any industry about what was perceived as accepted practices that today were perceived as unaccepted practices because we've evolved our thinking. So those three things, how we measure but also how we measure has created that very dangerous, unintentional perception that safety means not getting hurt. So anything that I do that doesn't get me hurt must be, it's flawed logic, but how we've measured success has really created that, you know, the, the mindset that we've, it's not going to happen to us and all that, you know, Shell uses the term chronic unease. I think mean, it's a great way to look at it. Uh, Centos uses the term positive discontent. We celebrate our success. We know we could always be better. So it's maturing the thinking around that, number one. And number two is having a strategy. You, you mentioned to, as in the opening comments of this, taking the business to the next level. Most successful businesses have a strategy. They have a strategy on how they face the market. What do we do to grow market share? What do we do to grow the market capitalization? Well, take that and focus those activities inside your organization. What's our strategy around culture? And with that, you have to have clearly defined end in mind objectives. You have to say, what does success look like? Because we have, we have a culture, right? You know, even if we are a startup, we're starting to bring people together and create those norms. Right. So what does success look like? Then you go out and gather data around where you're at culturally. What are the things that are currently creating the culture you have today? And what are the things that focused on would improve it? But that's like the Cheshire Cat said, if you don't know where you're going, then any path will take you there. People are going in a direction, but are they all going and marching in the right direction? Because any direction won't do. We have to define what that direction is going to look like when we get there culturally and then have a roadmap over the next several years to close that gap. I love how you go back to, if you think, you didn't say it as quite like this, but if you think you don't have a safety culture right now, you do. I think mm -hmm. that that is a simple, that's a simple takeaway right now is that if you don't, or if you don't think you have a strategy or if you don't think you, you, you do, it, but it's not, it's maybe not clearly defined and there's confusion and there's chaos in the midst of things. And so having a well-defined end goal or objectives, you're saying helps culture. And so that leads me to the, that's really interesting how you're going in that direction. And when you are consulting with a company, when you're helping a company out and let's say that they're struggling, what I've realized recently is that maybe the best safety consulting that I've seen, it's not just safety consulting. Am I right with that? Do you often find yourself <laughs> meeting with companies and, and there isn't, 
maybe safety isn't talked about the first day. You're looking at processes and systems and um, like you're talking about a company's overall strategy for growth. And sometimes that's, sometimes safety culture, it's not really a safety culture, right? It's just culture. It's the company's culture. So when you're meeting with a company, do you see a lot that maybe they think that they have a safety problem, but it's really not a safety problem. It's a company strategic problem. Do you see that a lot? Yeah, it's rare to find an organization that's fantastic in quality and delivery and cost, but really poor in safety or, or the opposite. Great in safety. I, I've shared the stage with a lot of CEOs, particularly in the oil and gas industry, that will say things to their group of leaders that I'm speaking to. If we're not great, it's something as important as safety. What else aren't we good at? That's an indicator of leadership capability. So, you know, I, I wrote a book with the term safety culture in it, but realistically, there's no such thing as a safety culture. You know, we're all talking about safety culture, but it really doesn't exist. So we've given it that term because there are common beliefs specific to safety. Think of stopping the job for work or for a safety concern. There are common decisions or common behaviors. So culture is what's common, but it's also beliefs that govern behavior. So we've given it that term safety culture. So we kind of have bookends. So we have some things we can talk about, but you're absolutely right. Safety is a part of the occupational culture. And when, when I, so I've done hundreds of safety culture assessments okay. and you can't help, but look at the other aspects of what influences how decisions are made in the organization. Right. And most companies, communication is an area where they can improve. Most companies getting the right leaders at the right level, whether it's executive or frontline leaders, truly engaged in leading safety. So HSE or EHS isn't the one leading it out in the field. You know, having employees you know, engagement, buy-in, participation, ownership, having them buy into things, having them participate, having them have ownership in it, having clear metrics that tell you not just how you did, but how to get better and why you got better. Yeah. You know, when, when I'm working with companies, one of the best feedback I get routinely from executives when they're looking at our models as we're helping them figure all this out, the common feedback, which is great to me, is if you take safety out of the conversation, we're having a conversation about how to improve the business. Yeah. And that's exactly the other thing I've seen is so, so we put, a, we, we continue to put a lot of our methodology in the public domain because it is safety after all. And we've seen several organizations that while you and I are really passionate about safety, the tools we use can improve other areas. And we've seen a lot of companies that after they start really going through the process that we teach on how to create strategy, they realize we could use this over here. We could use this in how we're approaching the market, which is fantastic because then we're using business improvement as a mechanism through safety. Yeah. And that's, to me, that's fun. That's a huge takeaway. And that's, that also um, makes me think, I don't know why this is taking me there, but you mentioned that you've done you know, so many safety culture assessments. Did I hear that right? Culture assessments. Correct. And so, you know, this might be a takeaway for somebody is, and let me just ask you, Sean, is what's more important or, or let me ask you this. What do you do first when you're walking into a company, they're, they're needing your help. Are you doing an OSHA gap analysis and you're looking at regulations and you're doing a gap analysis first, or are you doing a culture assessment first? So we don't touch the compliance piece the, because we work across so many different organizations. Well, well if, if compliance is within the scope of this, then we, we generally will partner with another organization. Um, so what do we do first? So when we're engaged, there's a lot of pre-work because one of the last things you want is having a focus group of individuals walking in the room, not having a clue why they're there. So there needs to be good communication because otherwise you're gonna put your guard up. Who's this guy from Houston? Why are we talking to him and everything? So you wanna have a lot of communication, but right. what we do perform is a tremendous amount of due diligence prior to arriving in the field at the site. So we are looking at their, uh, their compliance audits, assessments. We are looking to see their own internal work. 
We're also looking at the injuries, incidents, accidents that they've had over the past few years, and we perform multiple types of parade or analysis on it. Beyond the standard type of injury body part, we start looking at what we call a variable parade or analysis. So by that, I mean time of day, tenure, okay. all the other commonly tracked. Then we also go into a prevention parade or analysis. So what, what are the things that could have prevented these events? Is it largely condition? Is it equipment? Is it behavior? So we look at the prevention of that. So then we have a very clear understanding of what could have added value. Then we, when we're on, on site, we're asking questions, are they focusing on the things that add value? Because strategically, I kind of hinted at this earlier, to be strategic and safety, you need to be focusing on the things that make the biggest difference. And then we need to be focusing on things that create the perception of value with the workforce. And I'll give you an example of the first piece. Yeah. So a culture assessment of a coal-fired power plant here in America did all this due diligence up front, looking at their safety management system, seeing if there's, you know, how effective all the things are that they've put into play. One of the questions I was asking these employees is, what's safety focusing on today? What are they giving the most attention to? Because I knew what the focus needed to be on. Are they well aligned with what that is and how aligned is the workforce on that? Every right. employee I spoke with told me the same two things. Oh, same two. And I've never had that degree of alignment. They yeah, told me yeah. steel toe policy and housekeeping. Now, and initially you think, wow, they're aligned. That's fantastic. I think it was Drucker that also said, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently. That which should not be done at all. The two things they were focusing on, if they were perfect at steel toe compliance and have pristine housekeeping, over the last four years, it would have had an 8% impact on their incident rate. What they were giving the most attention to was not the most important thing. I so in trying to answer your question, we want to have some grounded understanding and then look at the organization. And then from that, the recommendations that we provide our clients is if I directly was working for the company, this is what my strategy would be focusing on over the next few years. Because the goal isn't you know, people listen to this might think, oh, he's full of it. The goal isn't to use more consulting time. The goal is to help your organizations internally have sustainable approaches. That I love that approach. That makes so much sense. And sure, I mean, whether you're a consultant and even an in-house safety, safety coordinator, the team needs to work efficiently, safely, all the above with or without you there. And I think that's a big thing is I met with so many safety professionals and they're like, Oh, I, when I'm on site, it's one thing. When I leave, I don't know what's going on. And like, that's a problem. And because safety can't be a department's responsibility. It, it has to, like you said, has, there has to be ownership from, from every level of the organization, obviously, or else, or else it, it, nothing's working or else something's broken. I mean, you have to do, yeah, there's really two pillars to what we call the bridge to safety excellence, which is, it's a model that's, that's out there in the, in the public, but there's the compliance piece and we have to have rules and we have to have consistent enforcement of those rules. And the enforcement has to have a balance of consequences. What happens if they're doing it? There needs to be a response, not just what happens if they don't. Right. So there, there needs to be, you know, management of compliance. But then the cultural piece, I'm keying in on what you said, what people do when the boss isn't around, what people do when those that can do the enforcing aren't around is a part of everybody's culture. So within that, yes, we have to obey the rules, follow all the procedures, wear all of our PPE, but people can still get injured. So you have to go above and beyond that. And when the culture piece what you need is you need a focus and you need a reinforcement of that focus, peer to peer type of thing. And Terry and I in our company, we kind of joke that there's not enough acronyms in safety. So we stay up late <laughs> at night trying to develop new ones to confuse the world. So focus to us stands for forming one common understanding of safety. I so what are the employees focusing on above and beyond rules, policies, procedures? Because you're right, things are getting reinforced employee to employee, but are there things in alignment with where the organization is trying to go? Or is it something in opposition of where they're trying to go and what's happening when the boss isn't around? Or what happens after an induction or onboarding? Let me show you how we really do things around here. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, 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 yes. And I thought something you said, it just really stood out. I wrote it down was, it's not enough data 
or it's not enough to say, hey, nothing's, we didn't have an incident this quarter. We didn't have an incident this month. Everything must be going right. That is a huge takeaway because I think as safety professionals, we're constantly looking at how can I prove my value? How do I know that we're being effective? How do I know that the safety program is working? It, it doesn't end at we didn't have an incident this month. Can you go a little bit more into that? I'm just curious with what, what you all mean by that. So if, if we're, if a safety professional is looking or is listening today and they heard that just because you didn't have an incident last month, doesn't mean that you're killing it. Maybe it does. Maybe it does. But what else should a safety professional be looking at if they didn't have an incident that month to know if they know if the program is effective? Yeah. Dean Spitzer wrote a book in 2007 and him and Terry initially started the company and then he was given a great opportunity and IBM left, but he wrote a book called Transforming Performance Measurement. And it's a fantastic book looking at measuring performance. One of the things he said in there that was, that was groundbreaking, the reason companies don't get what they want is because they're not measuring what they want. Think about how that applies in safety. One of my clients, Kelvin Roth, he, him and I were joking one time. He said, it's weird. It's like safety is one of the only areas where a downward trending curve is viewed as a good thing. Imagine that if we looked at that in sales and we're, we're, we're trending downward. No, that's so we have to flip that. We have to measure what we want. So that means we need to go out and say, well, what is it that we want and measure our progress towards that? And another Another way of looking at it, Dr. Larry Brilliant, and I love his name, Dr. Brilliant. He was part of the World Health Organization that eradicated smallpox in the 1970s. And a TED Talk around the same time, I think it was that Dean wrote that book, he had a mantra he was introducing when he was receiving this award from the TED Conference Organization. He called it early detection, early response. Think about that from a medical perspective. If we detect things early, we can respond. If your body reacts, that's bad. So the term respond. So are we measuring what we want? Do we have indicators that allow us to respond? Because it acts in its incidents, we have to react. So th there's that piece. There's also a study that came out of Harvard and authors went on to write a book about it. That was answering the question, what really motivates people at work? Yeah. And is it money? Is it, is it peer recognition? Different things have different staying power of motivation. The overwhelming conclusion, however, what it turns out motivates people most at work is visible progress towards a goal. The book they wrote is called The Progress Principle. So wow. think about how we're measuring in safety. We must be good. I don't see any accidents. Please let there not be any accidents. And if there's no incidents that we all will get a pizza party or a bonus. You know, which drives down jacket. reporting also. But so you, you have to, it's like in medicine saying the absence of visible disease must indicate the presence of health. So no, so the absence of accidents doesn't necessarily indicate the presence of safety. It just means accidents didn't happen or they weren't reported, but that doesn't mean safety's taking place. So safety is more defined by what we're doing than just the outcomes. So are we then measuring the drivers of those outcomes, not just measuring the outcomes? So that then goes culturally, not trying to be overly simplistic, but measuring culture is, do your people know what you need them to know? A lot of our clients, we call it the safety IQ. Do they know what you need them to know? Do they believe what you need them to believe? So part of that defining the end in mind, what beliefs, if became common, would be game-changing for our ability to improve safety? So do they believe that or not? Do they Are they able to do? So competency types of assessments. We have a client that they call it show me audits. Show me where that procedure is. So you can access it all the way to show me how to de-energize that piece of equipment. Or, so competency assessments. And then more informally is what's the storytelling that's taking place in the organization. All of those are measurable some more precisely than others, but an imprecise measurement of the right thing is better than a precise measurement of the wrong thing. Plus when we're just, when we're focusing not exclusively, but largely on the incident rate, think about what that is. So I, we're recording this right now on the 23rd of April. I want you to work harder for the rest of this month to fail less. That's basically what we're saying to people when we're using that failure metric as a way to monitor progress or not. Great. Celebrate your success when you have time without undesired outcomes. Absolutely. Then work to understand what's creating the lack of undesired outcomes. Oh my gosh. There are so many takeaways there. I think that's a huge one of just what can we be tracking and monitoring 
other than an incident rate or other than an incident? And what can we be really looking at doing a deep dive on our own companies when there are no incidents? I think that's huge. Um, so one thing that I wanted to shift into, into incidents. So I see on your guys' website, a lot of cultural, um, and we'll link up your guys' website. So everyone, the audience can just take a look at this, but you are offering a lot of seminars around culture. And something that you said struck this was it, looking at beyond the obvious of what happens. And so when you're maybe teaching about incident investigation or root causes, root cause analysis, what's a takeaway for the audience that they can apply in their process when doing an incident investigation? And they're maybe looking at, um, you know, the direct causes, but what are a lot of the indirect causes that you see um, when a company has a high incident rates? Is there anything that they, you know, maybe looking at the process of an incident? We, we work with a lot of companies use a lot of different methodologies. So I won't speak to any specific methodologies to, so as not to offend other methodologies, but there, sure. there's, there's good ones. There's more robust, there's more, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a mindset when it comes into human, it, I don't know if there really is a singular root cause. I think it's more contributing factors. But when when we're looking at this, so a couple of things, how we approach it. I've I've seen some really archaic approaches that the first question is, what could you have done differently? And so immediately you put the guard up. So how you approach that. But then so some of the key takeaways, behavior can never be the root cause of an injury, nor is it a final contributing factor because people do things for a reason. And if you don't discover that reason, what's influencing performance, you'll never truly get to the root of what the issue is. So when you look at reason, we, we break it up into four more simple categories so it's easier to develop action around. Perceptions, habits, and obstacles and barriers. Do, are, do they perceive the hazard and risk accurately? And again, how we've measured safety has unintentionally created the perception that, well, as long as I don't get injured. Then there's also habits we may not have effectively trained them, you know, to truly qualify them and how to perform that task. So they figured out a way to do it themselves. You bring attention to the risk of standing on top of a bucket, but they've just gotten the habit or using the wrong tool. Or what if the tool that we want them to use is inconveniently located? Or what if the tool is locked up, not accessible, not on the job site? People are motivated to try to get the performance done. So there's always influence that we have to identify what that is. So I take it a little bit further then. I say, okay, if we're not getting the desired performance, what are the reasons why? And right. I've landed on five. Um, you'll see a bell curve of distribution here, but there are sometimes people that are just unwilling to do what you need them to do. And sometimes right. deselection is the only real tool you have there. Hopefully very few and far between. Some people are unaware of the job expectations. They're, they're not certain on what they should be doing. Number three is that they're unable because of some of those other influences, or maybe we haven't trained them on how to perform how we need them to perform. Number four is that they're unaccountable. So we hold people accountable more largely for results. And it's usually a, we didn't get the results we wanted banging fist on the table, rather than what we refer to as proactive accountability, making right. sure people are doing the things necessary to produce results. And then five, it's just completely unlike the culture. So you have to look at what's really driving the outcome that occurred here, you know, was it, you know, one person making a one-off decision? Usually it's not. Usually there are right. systems, there are uh, schedule cost pressures on somebody to take a shortcut on a construction project, as an example. So we have to go deeper than just the individual, take the individual out of the equation. Had we put somebody else on that job, performing that task, might they have eventually taken that same or put themselves at risk whether they realize it or not. So it's really separating that human piece to understand what's driving the human decisions. Oh, I love that. Yeah. You know, or the, the employee had done that task hundred other times before with the supervisor watching him or her the entire time. And it was always, it was a cultural piece that it was always accepted, but now they're being reprimanded because there was an incident. So well, the, the other piece, if I may, the other piece of that is as companies get better and better at safety, as we've applied the hierarchy of controls, as there's a lot fewer high probability, high severity types of risks that are out there, what, what remains is low probability risk. 
And the problem with low probability risk is it flies under the radar of the two most commonly used tools humans use to perform their work. And that's common sense and experience. And common sense is sense about things that are common. Low probability risks aren't common. And experience, just because I've done it that way hundreds of times, never gotten injured. So our brain essentially sends, you know, our, our brain filters out a lot of the things that we're exposed to. And there's a lot of work on inten and intentional blindness. Look at the invisible gorilla. There's a lot of great work on that. You know, look out, motorcycles are everywhere because our brains aren't looking for motorcycles. We're looking for larger, which is why people sometimes pull up in front of a motorcycle. So really understanding that piece to it. But it's, you know, as we've gotten better and, and I'm keying in on while I was doing that task before, if it has a low probability risk, and if we haven't trained people, trained the brain and gone out and I try to identify what those things are, they tend to bite people because they've done it before. They're using their common sense. They're using their experience. We're not having a conversation enough to say before we perform this task, let's talk about all the big risks The now we're referring to them as serious injury, fatality types of risks. But what also are the common risks on this task? Where are the things where you could stand up into a valve stem? Where are the things that if you're not looking before you put a body part? All of those types of pieces. If we're not having that conversation to get somebody to really be thinking a few steps ahead, that's, we use the term, what can a master of chess do that an amateur can't? The answer is seeing several moves ahead. But if we can get people to see multiple steps ahead, but see them differently to look at hazards and risks differently than people perform their task, the incident often when it occurs, it's to your point, I've done it that way. I just, and we've put all these engineering controls in place, but engineering controls don't often address those low probability risks. Right. Right. And, and training, this kind of goes into the, one of the last things I wanted to talk to you about was training. You're saying if we can, if we can train our team to look at hazards differently, if we can, if we can talk about hazard identification different than the norm, then what can we accomplish then? And so that leads me to training. And I'm so excited to talk to you about this, but um, for, for medium size, for small, medium sized companies that maybe uh, just started uh, really honing in on their safety training program, they have a new hire orientation, they're doing the normal monthly safety trainings. What's some advice that you can give that you've seen the companies really, really help their program go to the next level. But beyond the OSHA compliance topics, what are companies with great safety cultures doing training on? And if it's safety culture, can you give us some examples of what type of training do these great companies give to their employees? All the compliance, OSHA 10, all those things are, are absolutely important to give people that foundation. It's absolutely critical. Uh, I, I, I first answer this by saying training is only as effective as the reinforcement that follows it, however. And yeah. training and training is antecedent. So we're, we're triggering, we're nudging things to occur. So if we also don't have a balance of consequences, if we're not managing the consequences with that, then training is just that. It's a prompt. So we have to get the training, we have to get the education and the experience as close as possible to the decisions people are making if we want to change behavior. Because when you look at training, Kirkpatrick back in 1954 said there's four ways to measure training effectiveness. Did they appreciate it? But bluntly, sometimes so what? I mean, there's some training that they're just not going to appreciate because we have to do it. But it's yeah. nice if they appreciate. But <laughs> did they learn anything post? Yeah. You know, post. Did it change behavior and did that contribute to business results? We see a lot of companies incident retrain. You know, and that's so. So the training is absolutely critical. But the companies that do a better job with this, they yeah. go out there and assess: is the training changing? what people know. Is wow. it changing what they're actually doing? So that means those kind of competency assessments, whether you have third-party inspectors or inspectors yourself, you know, looking at the behavior, but also with that training, realizing, it, again, it's just that's an antecedent. 
if we are asking people to perform their task in a certain way, we have to be out there. I, I like from the Toyota production system, Gimba, which is going out and involving people watching the work as it's being performed, talking to them about ways. That's where it makes an impact is where we're talking to folks. But more specifically, the training, a lot of it has to do with hazard identification, hazard risk. Okay. You know, I've, I have clients that they're putting GoPros on people's hard hats and walking a job site staged, of course, with risk low probability risk, high probability types of risk, and teaching people how to see things a little bit differently. So there's that type of stuff to, to start to affect the brain's ability to recognize things. And you know, it's job one of the, specific. Very job specific. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's there's some stuff that's out there, but it's it, it's not as effective if it's not relevant to the work that people are doing. It's going to be more memorable. You're going to get a larger return on attention if it's more specific. But, you know, a broader way to answer that really is coaching. And that's probably the companies that do a really good job with training. You ask, what, what, what else would they train on? Yeah, it's yeah. how to coach each other. It's how to have conversations. I had, I had a, a construction company inside of, of refineries, their contractor, and they put people through some training. We gave them the content and they made it very company specific, but they taught people how to have feedback, how to give and receive feedback about identified risk out there because not people, not everyone takes kindly to, you know, I'd like to talk to you about something I'm concerned about that I see that you're doing here. So they gave everybody that training. And then they asked people that if you feel comfortable having a fellow employee come up and, and have that conversation, we'd like you to wear the sticker on your hard hat that basically signals, it's okay for you to approach me about something you see that I might be doing, putting myself at risk. So teaching them how to have conversations about risk, because there's a lot of things that would demotivate somebody from talking to another person about risk on the job, trying to reduce those demotivators. Training is a way to do that, but then you have to go out there and execute the field and make, make sure it's executing the field that which you've trained them on. Okay. That is profound to talk beyond the regulations, but to talk to your team members about how to have tough conversations, how to, how to coach your fellow team member, how to receive um, tough or critical feedback and, and then how to give that too. And that to me, I resonate with that so deeply because if you think of any culture or any company that you've worked with where they were just struggling culture-wise, not safety culture, they were just struggling as a leadership team. And you could tell that management had conflict. You could tell that there was tension in a room. Oftentimes those people were great at one time, great at what they did and they were promoted to management, right? They never got the management training. They never got leadership training. And there's this built up resentment or tension because no one, maybe not no one, but it's hard. No one taught them how to be a leader and have those tough conversations. And so since there's tension between humans, we're all just human, then of course that will, that tension will then be out in the field and they won't know how to talk to their employees. And that's how you get to this sticky situation where somebody doesn't feel comfortable saying, Hey, I want to stop the job because there's, I don't like this person. I don't like my manager and I don't get along. So that makes so much sense. I think that's a huge takeaway for our listeners is look into this, these, um, these soft skills. Um, when you're looking at training your team and you're going above the, you know, beyond the regulations, I think that's huge. And, um, this also leads me into my last topic was, and it flows beautifully is you're talking about training and the training is as only good as the reinforcement and that reinforcement piece can maybe show up as audits, so to say, or site, you know, safety team is going out, they're visiting the field, they're making sure that what the training, you know, did it stick? Are they doing what we trained on? And so what are some things for safety professionals to consider when they're out doing day-to-day safety audits or culture or, you know, their safety audits, they're, they're looking at the OSHA regulations, but what else can they be looking at beyond the regulations when they're looking at their job site and it's maybe a day-to-day audit? Yeah, I think it, it, it boils down to the root and how we give people feedback about those audit findings. You know, we know how important positive reinforcement is, especially if we're married and have kids and everything. We know how important it is, but for some reason, when we 
come to work, we don't leverage it enough. Wow. And when we're doing audits and inspections, we tend to default what humans are hardwired to do, which is managed by exception. So you look for the things that are out of place, you address and give feedback until all's right in the world and nobody's saying anything. So right. you're reminding me of a, a group in, in, in the South, about a thousand person facility, and they had me come in, they felt the culture is going in the wrong direction. Short story is a group of employees, about eight, in a conversation, what are the safety conversations like? What do you all talk about? This is what this lady said to me verbatim. You know, in a few months, I'm going to retire after 30 years here. The only time they've ever talked to me about safety is when I've done something wrong. Just once before I retire, I wish they'd tell me when I've done something right. So that lady's career is safety is a conversation you avoid, which is tragic. So we look at these audits and e even the term audit, you know, tends to have a negative stereo uh, stigmatism to them. Yeah, so yeah. whatever term you use, you know, like the Hilton program, Hilton hotels, they have a program they call catch me at my best. Who likes to be caught doing anything? Even that term catch me is, yeah, is, is not terrible. desirable. Right. So it's, you first, so you have to go out and change what you're looking for to look for what you want, rather than the mindset that we're going out to look for people that are failing on the job. So you have to define it by what you want. Then you go out and you look for, are we getting what we want? So even the scores are how do we get better versus how do we fail less? But then how to give people the feedback, you know, I, I'm, I'm marking this task is safer. I see that you're doing that because you're performing it this way. Great job. Keep that up. If you think about how athletes continue to outperform other athletes, yeah. it's because they all have coaches and that coach is to help them perform to their best. So we're not out there trying to inspect for the fault, the faults, the, the failures, all of that type of stuff. We're out there to try to determine and we should have the assumption that people are trying their best. They're not trying yeah. to get injured. And yeah. how can we help our industrial athletes be the best that they can be? So that requires our mindset to be, we're out there to help them improve versus going out to find who's doing what wrong. And when we approach things like, like that, who's doing what wrong, then safety gets viewed very negatively and people work very hard to help each other not get caught. So you have examples yeah. When management's walking around, you hear bird signs being thrown. Caw, caw. You know, management's walking around, or there's oh, Charlie two, two, three, <laughs> yeah. something that signals others, watch out, safety's here. And if that's the viewpoint, you get avoidance behavior where people behave in a certain way just to avoid negative consequences versus they're behaving in a way to try to get better and they're recognized when they are. And that's where earlier I said you have to have that balance of consequences. What happens if they don't? Most companies have some approach to progressive discipline, mm -hmm. but what happens if they do? Not enough have approaches to progressive recognition. We're helping them and recognizing them as they get better. Sean, this is one of the best conversations I've ever had around safety. I, and Thank I you. Mean that, I, that is a, one of the biggest takeaways as a listener that if you're that is a huge mindset of how our industry as safety professionals, we are trained to look at hazard recognition in a way of what is going wrong here. And if I find everything that we're doing wrong, then we, then we can put together an action plan and we'll break it up amongst the year and we'll start working on everything that we're doing wrong. But catch me as my, as I'm at my best and, and find what I'm doing right and recognize me for what I'm doing right in this field. That is a huge mind shift. Well, bo both are important. It's just the optics of how that's received to the individuals. Right. Do we right. want them avoiding conversations about health and safety and environment, or do they see the value that it provides them off the job with their families, being yeah. able to execute the jobs, still on schedule, on time and everything? And I think that's, a huge takeaway too. I apologize. You might hear this train in the background, but um, that's the big takeaway too, is what that common thread of what you're saying is that a lot of these skills, almost all of these skills, as it relates to safety, know that these are not safety skills. These are skills that you're teaching your team to be a better human because we're not employees. We're not supervisors. We're not leaders. We're humans. And so when we perform like this, it shows up everywhere in our life. And I just, 
I would love to continue this conversation. I can't believe that I'm already over on time, which, you know, I kind of figured I would because I had so much to talk to you about. But if you're okay, I would love to continue this conversation and have a part two down the road because sure, be happy to. I don't want this conversation to end. So, wow. Like, thank you for that feedback and I'd be happy to. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Well, everyone, thank you so much. We will um, link Sean's contact information, how to get in touch with him, um, the business's website, all that fun stuff. And if you have any questions, if you have any feedback, if you want more from Sean, you will be able to reach out to him and be in touch and connect. But thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to our next conversation. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.